Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're currently going through the book of Genesis, verse by verse, and we come today to Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. Remember, you can study the whole Bible with me anytime you want to do it, as much as you want, whatever part of the Bible you want, or you can begin in the beginning and go all the way through the end, all 66 books of the Bible, even more, all 31,000 plus verses of the Bible, because this is a verse by verse ministry. If this is your first time listener, if you are a first time listener, I should say, then this is what I've been doing for over 34 years in the exact same way. Study the whole Bible with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that is found at the Bible Verse by Verse.com. I hope you're having fun in the book of Genesis. I'm having a great time. I love this book. And so we pick it up in chapter 28. I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. And I ask you, Father, to sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jacob has run away from his brother Esau, who has sworn to kill him. And uh, Jacob's Mom and dad, is, are the, they're the ones that sent him away uh, to find a wife up in the land of the Chaldees, where his mother is from, and where there are believers, unlike the land of Canaan, where they are surrounded by heathen. So Jacob is leaving to find a wife, and he's also leaving to run from his brother. And he goes, he goes like 40 miles the first day, which is a, a long trek on a camel. He stops and he camps, and he had a dream. He had a dream, and it says in verse 16, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now remember last time Jacob had this dream and he saw a ladder extending from earth to heaven and up and down this ladder like a escalator were angels. They were going up, they were coming down. And I mentioned last time, that's a good picture of what angels do because they are ministers. They are God's servants and he sends them from heaven to earth to perform a task. They do it and then they go back home up to heaven and report on how it went. And Jacob sees all this in this dream. And, well, what a dream it was, huh? And it says again in verse 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob was not afraid of the anger of God because he has just been assured of God's kindness to him. We saw that last time. God just, you know, spoke to him and blessed him big time. So he's not afraid of that. Jacob is afraid of the greatness and the glory of God. He's just in awe of God. And if you're in the presence of God, you will be humble. There's not going to be a smart aleck, flippant, overly familiar attitude toward God. When you're truly in his presence, there will be reverence and awe and a good solid fear of him. And that's what Jacob is feeling. 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. The oil marked the stone so that Jacob would recognize it when he returned that way. It was a memorial of God's goodness and mercy and the fact that God appeared to him there. 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Bethel means house of God. So it's a perfect name for a place where you have experienced the presence of God in a very real way like Jacob did. House of God. 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go. 
and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. Now, the word if, if God will do this for me, Jacob says. But the word if is not a sign of doubt. Jacob is not saying, well, I don't know, but God says he will be with me, and I sure would like to believe him, and so if. No, what Jacob is saying is, since God will be with me, and since God will take care of me. God has already given him the promise, and he's saying, well, if that's true, and he's not, it's not a question of doubt. If all these things that God has said to me and promised me is true, if, if that's the case, well, then this, this, and this, he will go on to say. So it's not, it's not expressing doubt. It's expressing just excitement over what God has promised. 21, so that I come again to my father's house in peace and shall, and then shall the Lord be my God. So obviously, God has promised him all these things. He's not saying that God would not be Jacob's God if he didn't do all these nice things. He's not saying that because he knows God will do all these things. I already said that. And by the way, God is not a God for hire. And Jacob does not expect him to be. Jacob is saying, when God does all these things for me, then it will stir me to serve him as my God even more. 22. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob tells God that he will give him 10% of his income. The 10% will help those who God has called to minister whatever form that would take back in those days. And it would be used to provide sacrifices and may be given to the poor even as well. That 10%, in other words, will be set apart for God's use. Jacob will use it exclusively for the work of the Lord and to minister in the name of God. Chapter 29, then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. It says he went on his journey. Jacob literally lifted his feet because he had just gotten a big shot of encouragement from God. He went on his journey, all right. He was flying high. He lifted his feet is what it's talking about, too. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And there were all the flocks gathered, and they rode the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. So Jacob arrives at his destination, the area anyway, and he arrives at the community well. The shepherds from that area would meet at that community well, and together they would remove that big heavy stone that covered the mouth of the well. The shepherds would then water their sheep, and then they would, they would all pitch in and put the stone back. Four. And Jacob said unto them, unto the shepherds, My brethren, from where are ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. Uh, this was God's leading right here. This is an amazing turn of events. This was God's leaving, leading pure and simple. Jacob travels about 500 miles without a compass, okay? He just traveled 500 miles without a compass or any road map or certainly no GPS. And he still manages to end up exactly, precisely where God needed him to be. Sometimes Christians, 
And I'm not talking about backsliding Christians. I'm, I'm talking about Christians who love Jesus. They get kind of shook up about missing the will of God. Well, the Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordained by God. And if you want God's will and you're living for Jesus and you're in the word and you're in prayer and you're confessing when you fail and you commit your way to God and you want him to lead you, don't be afraid. Don't, don't even second guess this. He is leading you. And you might not like the road that gets you to where he's taking you, but he's still leading you. You have his word on that. The steps of a righteous person are ordained by God. And this is an incredible thing to think about. He, again, I will repeat, Jacob traveled on camel or donkey or walked or whatever he did, 500 miles, okay? 500 miles. And he did it without a compass. He did it without a road map. And he still manages to end up precisely at the spot where God wanted him to be. <laughs> he could have gone a myriad of other directions. He could have swayed off. And yet, after traveling 500 miles, he's at this community well. And look what happens. 29. I said, I'm not 29, 29. Verse 6, and he said unto them, is he well? And they said, he is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. These men answered, yes, he's doing fine. Family doing fine. And just at that moment, Rachel, Laban's daughter, shows up. This is ladies and gentlemen, the providence of God in action, meaning that God directs all things, all things. This is my favorite biblical doctrine, I think. Of course, everything is my favorite biblical doctrine when I'm thinking about it. But since I'm thinking about this, I will say this is my favorite biblical doctrine. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's right up there. I'll tell you that. God's providence, his ability to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, govern absolutely everything that happens in all of his creation from what's going on on Mars, from what's going on in the furthest galaxy, to the microscopic level here on earth, to each one of our lives, to everything and anything that happens in all of his creation. God's providence is his ability to work all these many, many things every single second of every single day to put them all together like a big old jigsaw puzzle to bring about his eternal plan and purpose. That is God's providence. And you talk about miracles? Yeah, splitting the Red Sea, that was a big miracle. That is nothing compared to God's providence because he's doing this all the time. And you just tried to, I can't coordinate hardly anything, it seems like. But God coordinates everything. And as I said, as I said, this situation here is the providence of God in action, meaning that God directs all things so that everything happens at the right time, in the right place, including this. So, seven. And he said, lo, it is yet high day. Jacob said to these shepherds, it is after they told him that Rachel was coming, Laban's daughter. Jacob says, he says, he says lo, it's high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. And this has always amazed me about Jacob. He's being a little bit bossy here, don't you think? I mean, he just showed up in town. And he's telling these shepherds how to run their business. He's being bossy here. But I'll tell you why I think he's being bossy. is because he's trying to tell these men how to do their business. But he's also trying to get rid of them before Rachel arrives. Because he wants some alone time with her. 20, or verse 8, and they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then 
we water the sheep. They tell Jacob, we can't just water our flocks and then leave. We have to wait for all the shepherds to get here. Then we will all do it together. So, you know, mind your own business, Jacob. But there, this is what's going to happen. Jacob is going to meet. He doesn't know it yet, but God has led him precisely to the wife that he was searching for, only he didn't know who she was. How about that? And we're going to see that next time. But for today, I want to leave you with just the assurance of God's providence in your life, because it's there. Whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, it's totally irrelevant. It is there, ladies and gentlemen. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry and help me get out God's word verse by verse, pray for me. Pray for the word of God. When you take a break from studying, go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click the donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. And until next time, so long, everyone.